hi everybody. I am Emer Hurley. I'm the festival director of West Cork Literary Festival. Um, welcome to tonight's event. It's marvelous to have you here. We have a full house tonight um, with a hundred of you in the audience. So I'd like to just start by welcoming um, our speakers. We're here tonight to celebrate five Irish short story um, collections published this year. Um, Jan Carson, uh, whose book, The Last Resort, um, was published last week. Lucy Caldwell, um, her collection Intimacies will be published next month. Uh, Adrian Duncan, Midfield Dynamo was published in March. The End of the World is a Cul-de-Sac by Louise Kennedy was published last week also. And Pure Gold by John Patrick McHugh was published in February. Um, so I would encourage you obviously after tonight's event, if you haven't already read those collections to, to rush out and buy them. Um, they will all be available from our official bookshop, um, Festival Bookshop, Bantry Bookshop, but also hopefully from all um, from all of your local bookshops. So we would encourage you to support um, local bookshops wherever possible. Um, I would like to thank our funders um, of West Cork Literary Festival, the Arts Council of Ireland, Cork County Council, Falter Ireland, and the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union, um, who have made uh, all of these events possible. We'll be doing a number of other online events in the coming months, and we are still working on our plans for um, the official festival week um, from the 9th to the 16th of um, July. We're still waiting to see what may be possible that week, but we will certainly be doing um, quite a few events, whether whether online or, um, or, or, or in person. Um, for all of you in the event, if you want to chat to each other, you'll see a chat box at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if you have any questions for the speakers, um, you'll see the little Q&A box on the bottom right hand side of, of your screen. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand you over um, to Jan Carson, um, who will who will kickstart the event. So I hope you all have a wonderful time and, and enjoy the event. Thank you so much, Aymer. Um, it is really lovely to be sort of with you all tonight. We are coming to you from a number of different exotic locations across Europe this evening, uh, from London, Berlin, Connemara, Sligo and East Belfast. It gets progressively less exotic as we go down the list, um, but it's really, really lovely to be here and particularly lovely to have such an exciting lineup of speakers to talk about the short story and what we love about the short story. Um, before I get started, can I say a couple of thanks? First of all, a huge, huge, enormous thank to, thanks to Aimer and the gang at West Cork Literary Festival. And um, we approached them with this slightly mad idea about six weeks ago, and they said, absolutely, come on ahead, and really, really supported us in it. Um, and I also want to thank Sorsha Judge at Penguin Transworld, who did a lot of the behind the scenes organizing and admin that um, we don't really like to do very much. So thank you very much to Sorsha. And also thank you to our four fantastic um, short story writers who are joining me this evening. They're all going to get to introduce each other. So I'm not going to say anything more about them or their wonderful collections. And the final person I want to thank is Laura Vandenberg, the American short story writer whose idea this is and who I have completely ripped off and put in this format together. So if she is listening in or gets to hear about it, Thank you so much for letting us do this and you should all read Laura Vandenberg's short stories as well because they're absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm going to explain the format very quickly before we get going. Um, you're going to hear from each one of us in turn. We're each going to ask each other one insightful, really difficult story, um, question about the short story form that's peculiar to how we write. So we've spent hours and hours and hours thinking about what we really want to find out about um, each other's writing and we'll be posing that question. Um, each writer is going to answer that question um, and illustrate it with a short reading from their new collection and then they're going to pass the baton on to the next person and we'll go around in a bit of a loop. Um, each person will have about eight, nine minutes. So we should have about 50 minutes of insightful, difficult questioning, and then about 10, 15 minutes of questions at the end. So as Amer said, if there's anything you want to ask anybody about the short story form, please pop your question into the Q&A box and I'll be fielding those answers and questions at the end of the session. So without further ado, I get to introduce our first writer, 
who is a writer who couldn't be any further from how I write than I, I, I if I tried, but a writer who I have endless amounts of admiration for. Um, I'm introducing Adrian Duncan, who is coming to us from Berlin, so the most exotic of our writers tonight. Um, Adrian's on his third book. His first novel, Love Notes from a German Building Site, came out in 2019. It was shortlisted for the Dolky Emerging Writer Award and it won the John McGahern Annual Book Prize. It was also the very last book that I read before lockdown to send it. So I don't know if Adrian's responsible for the pandemic or what, but it, it brings up very, very strong memories in my head. Um, after that, he had a second novel, um, A Sabbatical in Leipzig, which came out last year. And being the prolific man that he is, he has now got a short story collection out at Midfield Dynamo, which is absolutely wonderful. And if you're lucky enough to be like me, you got yours um, straight from Lilliput with a tiny little Sabutio player in tow. Um, it's a brilliant collection. It made me really jealous because there's an incredible deftness and precision to the way Adrian writes. Um, Adrian's background is in engineering, and I can definitely see that in the way he puts together a short story. So my question for you, Adrian, to get us kicked off is, um, I just wonder how much structure and almost architecture comes into how you put a short story together. And I'd like to ask you if you could talk a little bit about when you come to write a short story, do you have a structure in mind? How much does that kind of structure and planning come into your writing? And how, how different that is from the short story form to the novels that you've written before. There's also a really interesting structure in the layout to Midfield Dynamo. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about how you've put the collection together, but it's arranged in a really interesting way. So I guess my question is, if you could talk a little bit about how structure and your kind of background in engineering and almost precision comes into your writing technique. Okay, um, I hope I've demuted. I have, yeah, good. Okay, um, thank you very much, Jan, for that lovely introduction. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to this lovely event. Um, I'm really um, pleased and honored to be taking part. Um, so yeah, in terms of the writing of a short story, I suppose like, what I should do is I just should say that when I, I started writing, I started doing evening classes in um, creative writing, let's say in 2008. So I was about 30 or so. And um, I can safely say I hadn't written anything of a creative kind since my leaving cert which had been in 1995 so and um, that was probably my last creative writing uh, act was my leaving cert english exam in 1995 um but then over the course of my 20s i realized that my engineering career wasn't kind of doing enough or i wasn't connected enough to the work so i decided to to do two things in 2008 so i went to art college in Dunleary and i started to create a writing course up in the irish writer center and when I was up there, I was introduced to this idea of not planning your stories or not to, to try and write without planning. Um, and this to me seemed very strange because I'd come from, you know, 12 or 13 years of planning and thinking deductively about pretty much all of my uh, work. So I decided to kind of just take a leap of faith in, in relation to this idea of not planning your writing. And I actually took it very, very seriously. And I took it seriously to the nth degree to the point that I don't plan anything, any piece of writing that I write, I don't plan at all. It's, I just start with a color or an image or, or a sentence and if there's energy in it, I continue writing and if there isn't, then it falls off. And um, so for the first couple of years when I was writing like this, I described this kind of writing out of the back of my head, there's no real sense to it, you know? And um, what I produced were things that you couldn't really call short stories. I don't even know what they were. They were just a series of things. And then I just kept trying and trying and trying. And Brendan Barrington actually was, was really good in the Dublin Review. I used to send him short stories and he'd knock back, send them back to me, say, oh, this doesn't really work. And then maybe, you know, here's what I think is missing or whatever. It was gentle, very, very gentle suggestions. So this went on for about five or six years. And then eventually I started actually producing from this non-method things that ended up having a narrative arc, you know, a change in them. Um, and then art of art could be anything from, you know, something really, something actually changing within the narrative or something changing in the mind of the actual first person, uh, the, the, the narrator. Um, so I started realizing that within this way of working, I could find a way of telling a story, as it were, something with a, with a dramatic art, let's say, a complete dramatic art. Um, so that's really how I've negotiated it. It's, it's not from planning, it's from when does the story stop and then what is it 
and how can I then come back to it years later and see what's actually, what can I do with this? Where is, who is in this and what is in this and how can I complete this thing? Um, so plot doesn't really come into the, an awful lot for me, but it's more so how can I complete what this is? Um, so that sometimes, so let's say there's a few stories in the collection, particularly let's say, um, um, yeah, so um, Oregon Grape Tree, for instance, I started that back in 2008 or so, and I really only pulled it together this last summer, you know, last 2020, um, because I just didn't, couldn't understand it. And there's a few others of that kind. And then some come more immediately, like Prozanecki came in an afternoon, and then some just don't. And that's, it's just how it falls. There's no, it's a very, it's a very unprofessional, I think, <laughs> way of working. If someone contacted me and asked me for a short story, I don't think, I, I, I may or may not be able to actually turn one out, I don't know. And um, so it's pretty formless, I would suppose, is what I'd say in terms of the structure. And um, in terms of then the structure of the actual book itself, um, so yeah, last summer I had uh, a number of short stories and I kind of whittled them down to about 12. So there's 11 short stories that are told in the first person and then there's one short story that's told in the third person. So it kind of came to me last year, about this time last year or so, it kind of struck me that I had awful trouble trying to understand the stories in a list and what one should come before or after the next because there's such resonances that go through them. I just couldn't, uh, I was never satisfied which one. I'm sure all of you have had this, this problem. So what I decided to do was I decided to break the structure, the list open into um, a football starting 11. I don't think you can see that, can you see that? Yeah. Um, and by breaking out the list into a sort of a, an arrangement of 11, I was able to sort of see the connections between the, the stories a little bit more easily. As it, it was John McGahern used that lovely term that short stories in a collection lean on each other. Um, and in, the, in that structure, I was able to see, I could see the directions that the stories could lean sort of. Um, and also by doing that, I realized that there was a certain personality in each story as well. And that that personality would suit a certain position on the pitch. So then it started becoming easier for me to understand the form of the, of the book. And all of that collapses back down into a linear <laughs> series of pages anyway. But I wanted to show the process. So that's why the book has that form of a, of a first team 11, because that's how I, that's how I visualize it. Um, and I'm a huge interest in football uh, as well. And I, I love watching and playing and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's, and the other thing about it was that there's no page numbers beside the, the names of the stories. And because the book isn't that big, I was kind of interested in the reader just kind of feeling their way into it, you know, kind of, yeah, Prozanecki is around the middle. I go in near the middle and try and find it there. So it's kind of like interesting the idea that this could become a kind of a bit of a sculptural object because the reader has to negotiate it in a kind of, you know, in a less kind of, um, you know, demarked way, like, oh, there's page 20, I'll go there. So th those are the kind of things that I was thinking of in terms of the structure of the book itself. And um, I've probably gone on way too long. Um, so what I'll do is I'm just going to read a little bit of uh, one, one story, if that's okay. Um, it's called We Two of Windblown Plazas. And it's about maybe one, two, three, just, just over three pages. Um, that, that'll be, that's not too much time. That'll be okay, I think. Um, so it's a story about, with all of this formlessness, um, I may as well read a story about an engineer. So it's about a young engineer called Foster who's moved to Abu Dhabi during the recession to work. Um, for a very, very wealthy Belgian hotelier. Um, and Foster is the senior design engineer, let's say, on a very, very tall hotel in Abu Dhabi. And the story that we're gonna read from is they're out for lunch and then they strike up a sort of friendship. This engineer Foster, who's Irish, and this guy called Van der Voude, who's a Belgian um, hotelier. Okay, so I'll just read. Um, During lunch one day, in the last few weeks of the hotel project, I was sitting in a tinkling restaurant across from Van der Voude, who was chewing emphatically on a large leaf salad. Over his shoulders, stands of high rises receded into the hazy distance. Cranes swiveled on top of these structures, delicately lifting materials up and down. Though it was smoggy, I could still make out tiny shimmering men in yellow hard hats darting around these distant floors, carrying out their work in slowly making real another person's roaring dream. Van der Voude put his knife down and said, that he considered me a fine engineer and that I'd done good work for him. You should visit my apartment in the, uh, my apartment some evening, he said, as he forked a cherry tomato, if you've nothing else to do. I called up the following Friday. His apartment was on the 60th floor of an obnoxiously vertical building across town. 
I was greeted at the door of the apartment by a stout Filipino lady in her late 40s who was dressed in a neatly pressed black and white uniform. She led me into a cool and expansive living room fringed with wobbling tropical plants. Van der Voodoo was reclined on an antique chaise longue, reading a National Geographic. He wore tracksuit bottoms, flip-flops and silk and green dressing gown. He asked the housekeeper to leave and to bring his cat too. He had told me that it was in must and had been mewling horribly at its own reflection all day. He then bade me sit next to him and offered me a beer, which I at first refused, but he insisted. So I gave in and, at his further insistence, I relaxed. Befriending him, I thought, would serve me well. We drank a number of beers and chit-chatted about the city, his hotels, and the plans he had for more. Then he reached forward and from under the coffee table he produced a dark Tupperware tub filled with tiny plastic bags of pills and white powder. He inquired if I'd ever taken class A's before. I have not, I said. We took MDMA in a little Librium. It was fucking extraordinary. Hours later we were laughing on the couch. My mind had voided upward, heavenward, foreverward. My pupils were rolling back in my eyes like small breaking tides and my mouth gurned ground and chewed on dry cud. I was grinning extravagantly at van der Voode, who was regaling me about the sex clubs he used to visit in Belgium as a younger man. He said he missed that free and blissful part of his life dearly. I shook my head, gazed over the twinkling tubes of the city, took a sip of beer and said, you're some man. Then I rose from the couch, turned up the techno that had been thudding softly through the room and I began to dance. Hours later, as I was leaving his apartment, he called after me. Stay a while longer. I have some grass. We can come down together, he said. He was standing at the entrance to his sitting room, sipping tea. He put the cup down, stalked back into the room and slipped out of his clothes. He unfurled his thickening white body onto the chaise longue, shook out his hair and arranged himself on his side, propped up on pillows with his right hand to the floor, the left resting across his genitals. Then he fixed his gaze olympically out at me. His cat sprang onto the foot of the chaise longue and the Filipino lady appeared behind him drawing the curtains across the window. The image flickered in my mind as I turned and left. His apartment door then swung to behind me and in that moment between the click clump of the door closing and the ping of the hall lights flickering on I stood, suspended in the cool humming darkness of the corridor, itself tracing a truncated architectural trajectory through the early morning sky at moment I had momentarily just become. I took a taxi across to my apartment where I sat out on my balcony, 12 stories up. I looked towards the sun rising in the east. The buildings glinted and on the ground way below, the shadows of these towers folded themselves across each other. I had no idea how far east I was. I yearned for some energy, but I had already succumbed, succumbed to sleep. My eyelids drooped and the dawn breeze slowing to a near standstill. I felt it creep across my forehead was sucking sweet be sweat beads from my pores. I drew in a cigarette and fell further back into my body, my spine, my buttocks, through the straining deck chair canvas and into the floor and walls of my apartment until I felt myself coalescing with the entire building. Then I filled the building, every floor, every corridor, every room and every shoe in every room with an in Amazonian inhalation of smoke. The smoke cloud lingered and curled into the air conditioning currents, swirling through the space. Then I exhaled brutally, voiding the structure. Everything left behind created reverbs through my body. I felt the breeze meet the surface of the windward face of the building over and again. Then moments later, I felt the suction of these passing breezes on the leeward face as they gathered around and tug gently at the back of my neck, dissipating shudders from the top of the structure all the way down to the ground. I felt every beam and column translate these deflections and surface resonances into multitudes of smaller vectors that advanced inward to the lift shaft of the building where these forces and ideas of forces were absorbed, subsumed, then guided down along the calcifying grid lines of the lift shaft's abst abstract prehistory, onward, slowing, downward, crawling, towards a dark and wet subterranean bedrock where all of this was still to nothing against the gorgeous inertia of the earth. Okay. So I'm going to fulfill my duty now of um, moving the conversation on to um, John Patrick McHugh, um, whose work I've been reading kind of from a distance through publications like Tangerine, I think Tangerine and the Sting of Fly and places like that. Um, 
so I was really delighted earlier this year when I saw that his book was coming out in New Ireland. Um, I know Aoife Walsh in New Ireland, and I know she's a huge fan of short stories, so I was really happy to see this happening. Um, so there's a couple of questions that I would like to ask of John, if that's okay, um, in relation to his work. Um, the, there's two stories in the middle of the collection that I'm going to kind of base this on. One of them is um, called Pure Gold. It's the short story told in, 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 from the first person uh, position. And then the next story after is called Horforst, which seems to me to be a sort of third person position. Um, and I was very, very interested in the unbelievable uh, use of dialogue in this, in this book, um, largely because I'm terrible at dialogue. I'm always amazed at people who are really brilliant at it. Um, but I was really, really, really enjoyed um, this aspect of the book, not least uh, among all the other aspects. So I wanted to ask, how, first of all, again, it's sort of like a two-part question like Jan's was to mine, um, and then I'll just pass it on to you. First of all, how did you develop this, this, how did you develop this, this, this ability to write convincing and interesting dialogue? And then second of all, in the process of writing this, is there, apart from the sense that the dialogue is carrying um, a sort of a sense of character, it's also producing a sort of positioning of people relative to each other. And I just wanted to ask about that process, the timing, but also the spatialization of, uh, of the people involved in these sometimes one, two, three, and four person uh, uh, dialogues and how you, what's your process in kind of producing that, that space that's, that just sits beautifully in the, in the text and sits beautifully in your mind when you're reading it. Um, and yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Adrian. Um, they're great questions. And before I answer them, I just wanna say how, how, how lucky I feel being amongst such um, talented writers. Um, yeah, so dialogue, it doesn't come easy. Um, I was absolutely terrible at dialogue uh, when I first started writing. Like I would just try to write stories where no one would talk to each other because I felt like it would be a lot, my life would be a lot easier that way. Um, but eventually I was, I remember I was taught by Mike McCormick in, in my, during my BA I remember that was the one thing he always kind of got at me about was my my dialogue and lack thereof. Um, and yeah, so like over the last, it was the one thing I really had to work on dialogue. And the way I kind of did it was I read a lot of plays um, and I kind of got fascinated by, especially in kind of Beckett plays, like the tension and the terseness of dialogue, the repetition, how emphatic a single word can be, you know, how it can just completely change the dynamics of a, of a scene. Um, and even a one man play like Crap's Last Tape, that like stayed with me for ages. And I always find it funny when I say my influences, because I know I write like none of the people I really, <laughs> you know, I, I'm really inspired by. But Beckett's use of kind of dialogue, his back and forth, really inspired my di my dialogue and my stories and how he just used that tension, the national natural tension in dialogue and words, because they're so weak and flimsy and when you kind of listen to people talk, they never answer questions and they go backwards, like I'm doing now, you know, where they go backwards and they get kind of lost. I was really kind of grew fascinated by that. Um, yeah, so Beckett in a lot of plays, I remember um, Joyce has that famous scene in um, Portrait of the Artist, a young man, where they're discussing Parnell and they're having dinner. And I remember like reading that again and again with a pen, just kind of noting who's talking how do you know who's talking? How do you know who's not talking? And that sense of flow of dialogue in that like was really, really um, fascinating for me and something I kind of tried to study. And I suppose the other person was J.D. Salinger. Um, his dialogue is amazing. And the way he describes smoking a cigarette while talking is, you know, the best there is. But, you know, the problem with Salinger is like no one talks like Salinger around me. <laughs> so I had to kind of uh, work on that. So yeah, characters started to decide um, the kind of my dialogue, but they were the kind of influences I remember kind of coming back to again and again to kind of to get better, to kind of learn and stuff like that uh, and how they place it. And then in terms of like spatial awareness and like characters and time when it comes to dialogue, I kind of love all that. And I love how dialogue, you can really use the white space um, and you can almost use it as extra tension I feel like a bit of a magician revealing his tricks with this one, but my favorite thing to do is like have character A say, are you leaving? And then, you know, line break and then character A saying, no, really, are you leaving? And I just find that 
like it's such a beautiful trick of fiction and reading because the reader will invent the time in between the words if you get me they'll kind of call the tension themselves so i just find that kind of fascinating and when it comes to kind of set pieces like in hoarfrost and pure gold uh, and there's a couple of stories where there's like three or four characters talking i love the ability you can have to have people not answer questions or have people speak over other people um and a lot of that kind of comes from i suppose comes from the plays and kind of seeing how that kind of is done in a play and then seeing if you can translate that into fiction in terms of like using objects to kind of signify who's talking who's not talking and breaking up uh, tension and building tension by having like repetitions or a character talking twice or a character talking without being listened to and stuff like that um yeah so that was always kind of my my main influence when it comes to dialogue is those kind of three blends and that's always my attention then when it comes to group dialogue can I build attention can I have someone talk over someone um can I make you feel like you know who's talking and how the tone they're talking without telling you that's I think you know that's the thing that really fascinates me about writing is like can I get away with stuff um can I make the readers do the work um can I make them like realize that this character is actually really annoyed or something like that in his dialogue uh or their dialogue yeah so to I'm going to read a story which isn't one of those two mentioned uh, it's the last story it's a short story and i think that is like four characters and they're all age 12 and they're all very funny uh and basically the setup is it's two boys wanting to go on a date with two girls and they just want to kiss them uh and my book is called pure gold and this is the last story it's called a short story what was i going to ask studsy announced Studsy stretched out both arms, rotating them at the wrist. He clicked his tongue. Oh, yeah. He looked at John and he said, you two heading to the disco next weekend? Studsy answered his own question. I'm going. Be my second one, like. I went to Christmas madness in January there. He batted at his nose with an open palm and then at the water as if it was in his way. It was class, he said. Karen said that she probably would go if she could afford a ticket and if she wasn't at her cousin's in Cork that weekend and if she doesn't have soccer or piano lessons. Some of Nee's hair had frizzed around the back of her neck, string, stringy, and it reminded John of grass poking out along the margins of an old road. Then it reminded him more of a lady in that booby magazine and what was so cyrical and tantalizing within those pages. He required to see it ceiling. You know, this fella's ma'am has him banned from discos, Studsy said. A beast, a stifled giggle from Karen, and then John clocked this was aimed at him. No, she doesn't, John snapped. Studsy beamed toothily at the girls. I haven't even asked yet, John continued faster. He was unsure suddenly if he may, in fact, have been banned from the discos. Was Studsy privy to knowledge he was not? John forced a laugh, which clicked hollowly rather than rang out for the girls to hear and acknowledge him as an active and enthusiastic player in the joke. His cheeks were warm. I definitely will be going. I definitely will be going, Studsy mimicked. Neve and Karen laughed. Ignoring this, John asked in Neve's general direction, will you be heading to the disco yourself? John's cheeks were very warm now. In fact, were burning, possibly were melting. Studsy persisted. Well, your man didn't let you go last time, did she? John shook his head as merrily as he could to demonstrate he was fine with the joke continuing. In on it, actually. That was last time. She never said anything about the next one, John said, and he looked at no one in particular. I'm not banned or anything. Neve had not responded or indicated she had heard his question and it terrified John that he may have been ignored, silently ridiculed and was now tainted, sunken. But maybe, John reasoned, she just not heard it. Perhaps the question had sort of glided over her, uncatchable, like a shanked kick pass. My mam said nothing about the next, next disco. John explained and hesitated and then added with slowed authority. Seriously, I'm not banned. The most miserable action John could undertake now was to repeat his question to Neve. 
Even if she just hadn't heard, it would still be desperate. It would be sad. He shouldn't do that. John said to Neve, so you think you'll probably be heading to the disco as well? I'll leave it there. Um, it's also funny at these events because you can't hear people booing or clapping, so it's also a weird <laughs> ending. But anyway, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Louise Kennedy uh, next up. Louise Kennedy is the author of The End of the World is a Cul-de-Sac, which just came out last week, and which you probably heard about over the weekend. They got glowing reviews in the Sunday Times. It was very nice. A lovely cartoon of Louise as well, which I've never seen before, but I really liked. And a lovely review in the Irish Independent as well. Um, I've known about Louise's work for years. I was very lucky to be in a couple of magazines with her. And I've always just been struck by how good of a writer she was. And I always had a, a, a guy from Belfast called Nicky Nolan uh, reminded me of how good Louise Kennedy's work is. Um, so my question to Louise um, kind of comes back to setting, reading The End of the World, the cul-de-sac. I was kind of fascinated by the settings in each story and how integral they were to the plot and how the story was told. So my, and I gotta have to check my notes. <laughs> so my question was come back to actual spark and spur of the story. Does the setting almost inspire the story and then the characters and their motivations within that story? Or is this the setting something that the characters themselves inspire to their dynamics or relationships? And then the two part, the second part, very general. What does setting mean to you as a writer? I'm thinking here in terms of like tension and uh, drama, is that the only way you think of it? Or does setting, if you kind of get the blood of like a real place into a story, that, does that allow you to get more outlandish in your fiction, you know, kind of grounds it a little bit? So I hope those stories, those questions. Um, thanks for that lovely introduction, you're very nice. Um, I, I think um, the, there's always, I think with me, there's always something going on about place. Um, and I think that's because wherever I am, I'm out of place um, because uh, I don't live in the place where I grew up and I've lived in lots of places since then. So, you know, my home place, it, it, I mean, it isn't really there anymore. It's nearly like a, a construct or something at this stage. So, um, so for example, you know, I live in, in Sligo in the Northwest and um, I've been here for 20 odd years. And um, uh, I, I, um, I'm always looking at it as, a, as an outsider um, and I have children who I take for walks and things and there's maybe a combination of my own curiosity about um, about what places are called and about um, I sort of have a thing about um, sort of grasses and wild flowers and things and I very often don't know what they are so I take a lot of photographs um, and I take in place maybe um, sort of by ear or something as well so I tend on a walk I tend not to I don't really like to put headphones on um, and stuff because I like here and even if it's just traffic noise or bird song or whatever or, or um you know and I like the kind of stinky smell you get down at Gibraltar um, at low tide and things like that um so um yeah I think I think that's maybe it and, and I think um as well that um I, I, my favorite book when I was a child my mother gave me well she gave me a couple of books of uh, Sinead de Valera's um uh, fairy tales for for children and those were full of stories about um a sort of magic magic lakes and spooky trees and things like that and I think there's sort of that going on and there's maybe also something about living here specifically because um so so yeah, I, I I love the idea of landscape but also um you know the the, the the natural aspect of that you know about what grows here but I'm also um really fascinated by the marks that people have left uh, on landscape and that's very visible here maybe in a way that it isn't in in other places so um you know, from one of the windows upstairs, um, just one window um, where the washing machine is, but I can see um, the cairn on top of, of Knock where, um, where, like, I don't know, four and a half thousand years ago, people literally carried uh, stones to the top of it to bury somebody important um, who uh, supposedly might be, it might be Queen Maeve. I like to think it's Queen Maeve. Um, and, you know, if I walk from my house to, to, to Lidl instead of, um, of driving, I, I walk, you know, through a, a 1960s housing estate um, and, and through this, you know, past a few bollards, uh, a, a blocked road, and then on the right hand side, there's, um, you know, the air offices um, are there, this sort of, of um, 1980s office buildings, but right in front of it, there's a ferry fort, and it's in a really weird place as well, so clearly builders or somebody wouldn't, they wouldn't touch it, so it's there with, you know, there's this sort of hump piece of ground with the ring of trees, so I think it's maybe that, you know, living here, you can't really ignore that we're not the first, um, 
people to move across the landscape. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I, I suppose starting with those those fairy tales and stuff, I'm still interested in in mythology uh, uh, and stuff as well, and folklore. You know that idea of of um, I'm, I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong, but is it uh, Din Shankas? You know that Irish idea of of the lore of of place. Um, so I mean, I think these are things that I I'm interested in anyway, um, and I also get a bit. Um, uh, kind of fixated on places. So, you know, for a, a full month at one point, I brought my children to Hazelwood every day after school um, and took loads of photographs. And I was there in all kinds of weathers and it does it never looks the same. You know, even, you, you know, we'd arrive at three o'clock and by a quarter to four, it, it'd be like a different place because the light would have changed and, and weather would have come in or something. Um, and I suppose um, around that time, so for example, okay, about so, so all of that stuff is going on with place. I'm just trying to think what the question <laughs> question was. All of that stuff is going on with place, okay? And then, um, so around that time, I was in Lidl. I, spe I spent an inordinate amount of time in Lidl, actually, but um, I was in Lidl again, and um, there was, um, I was queuing up um, at the checkout, and there was a man in front of me, and he had a small um, girl in a trolley, and she had a really snotty nose, and it was, you know, a cold day. And um, she was wearing this kind of pink padded jacket, and... Um, he pulled, the, the zip was all the way up to the top, but uh, he turned around to put the stuff on the conveyor belt and she pulled it all the way down. This happened about three times. Um, and he looked like, I, I presumed he was her grandfather or something, um, but he was um, older and she called him, you know, quite a bit older uh, uh, and she called him daddy. Um, and there was just something about his big hands trying to wrestle that zip and looking kind of surprised, but like not unhappy about being a father um, when he looked like somebody's granddad. I don't know, I think that kind of stuck with me. But I had to take, um, you know, that isn't enough. There isn't a story in that really. Um, but th th that kind of sat with me for a few days. And uh, But I had to put them somewhere. So I think that's that's what happens. And I might have an idea, but until I have a, a location, I need to put them in a, you know, I need to put the characters or, or the idea in a place. And then uh, and then I, I, I find that story will start to, to generate. Um, so I wouldn't be thinking, you know, about character or whatever in advance or story. I have no idea what's going to happen. There'd just be some sort of a, a, an idea, um, but definitely um, place um, feeds it, I think. Um, and I suppose the second part um, is, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that place can be used in all kinds of different ways in fiction. I think, um, you know, it can be used um, to show uh, constriction. You know, the idea that maybe you, you might have characters in a place who, who are sort of confined by uh, by where they are and not even know that there's another world out there. Um, I suppose, you know, an example of that might be, you know, a Brokeback Mountain. Um, um, that You know, those men clearly have no idea that they could have gone to San Francisco or something. Do you, do you know, they just wouldn't have entered their heads uh, or, or whatever. But, um, um, and then I suppose, um, you know, because I'm always out of place, I, I suppose then, there can be other issues that if you're in the place that you come from, but you're stuck there and you can't get away, then there's there's conflicts in, in that as well. So yeah, I think it just can, can function on all kinds of levels. Yeah. Um, so um, I suppose um, I'm gonna read from the story that has kind of most of those um, elements of, of place um, is, is the last one. Um, because I guess there are, I mean, there were kind of two, the story's called, Gar called Garland Sunday, and there's sort of two narratives running, um, not quite side by side. I mean, I guess one of them is to an extent sort of shoehorned into it, sort of hinted for, for most of the story, and then and then makes more sense towards the end. Um, but it's um, attached to a place actually that's in um, in South Sligo that was one of my obsessions for, for a while. And um, uh, yeah, so it probably has most of, of those, um, elements you know there's there's folklore there's location um and the, the story actually was um you know it originated with um something that I was told as an anecdote an anecdote and it was about um somebody told me about an infanticide that she claimed had happened quite recently like maybe in the 80s or something and um I tried to find out about it but I couldn't find anything at all and I started to wonder if maybe it was and then I, and, 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 so what I was told was this woman in the 80s had taken her baby to these caves and killed it with a stone which is like horrifying but I couldn't find any trace of it but then when I looked into the mythology of the of the mountain there were all of these stories and there was all of this lore associated with it about um 
mostly about sort of hags and, and witches and abducted children. So I just wondered if it was almost like a, some version of, a, of an urban myth. So that's that's kind of where it started. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking and let read a bit. Orla's fingers worked through the leaves, picking off the fruit one by one, dropping them into the plastic bag that hung from her wrist. Frocken, Winberry, Myrtle, Bilberry. She put one in her mouth and bit down. It was juicy and tart. When she had enough for a cake, she took out secateurs and began to cut. Soon she had filled a garden refuse sack with branches. She made her way across to the lip of the ridge. The hillside sliced down towards the road, shorn like a lawn by the sheep that clung to it. In front of her, over fields and bog and a silver lake, were the hills of three counties. Behind her, the wind was blowing through the caves. She started along the path. It hadn't rained for days and scree scattered under her feet, making her break into a run. She was panting when she reached her car. She put the bag into the boot and set off for home. On the bend beyond the hill, Orla had to pull up on a grass bank to let a truck pass. She was outside the Lavin place, a cottage with a tin roof and a glossy red door that her father-in-law owned. Dog roses brushed the whitewashed walls. A hydrangea hedge separated it from a triangle of ground furred with bright moss, a killeen. She had read somewhere that three corners were easier to defend against the fairies than four. There were no crosses or markings on the graves, just humps here and there, scarcely bigger than molehills. An unblessed place for those buried with sin on them. The driver of the truck beeped at her to edge forward onto the road. He was thick set with a rose gold cross around his neck. For all tents and purposes was printed on the side. He gave her a slow wink as he passed and she wondered was he the man who'd come up with the slogan. Orla took the bag of branches from the car and laid it on the patio table. She went into the kitchen through the back door and put the berries by the sink. The vacuum cleaner was going in one of the bedrooms. Kathy, the cleaner, didn't like to work around Jerry, who was at the table, his laptop open. There was a box of trophies and, and medals in front of him. Orla picked up a statuette, a brassy atlas. Sheaf tossing, first place was engraved on the mahogany plinth beneath his feet. The marquee people are there now, she said. Right, said Jerry. How's the speech going? Getting there. He spread his shoulders so she couldn't see what he was typing. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce Lucy. Um, I have uh, I actually had loads and loads of questions um, that I wanted to ask Lucy, but I can't ask all of them. And um, so uh, I, I just tell you some of the ones that I wanted to ask. Um, I, um, today um, I, I was re I, I, I couldn't stop reading actually even getting beyond the first couple of pages of um, of intimacies. Um, because of some of the language that you, you used around sort of small children and stuff. So I nearly lost my reason over, um, I have to have a look and see, where was it? Milk drunk um, and brutal as well. So I'd love to have been able to talk to you about that um, because some of that's just delightful. And, um, and then um, as well about your use of the, of the second person, which I'm really fascinated with, but I'm not gonna ask you either of those. So what I do want to ask you uh, about is, um, is about the element of, um, of sort of flannery in, in, in the stories, um, that very often the characters are, um, are sort of walking a city. And I, I think it's particularly affecting, you know, I find it uh, particularly affecting when it's, um, when it's Belfast. And um, I'm wondering about, um, you know, this idea of the sort of character as flaneuse, um, is um, because you're writing away from home that you're writing from, from another place? Thanks, Louise. It's such a good question. And hearing you talk about walking through landscapes and everything and, and your own work, it brings a whole new depth to that, that notion. I was so glad you asked me this question. Um, I'm going to reply by reading um, Intimacies Isn't Out for Another Month. I'm going to read two very, very short, par long paragraphs. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't not read this walk through Belfast. Um, which comes from my first collection, Multitudes. The story is called Here We Are. The summer is a washout. Every day the heavens open and the rain comes down. Not the usual summer showers with their skittish, shivering drops, 
with heavy, dull, persistent rain, true Drake days. The sky is low and grey and the ground is waterlogged, the air cold and damp, blustery. We don't care. It is the best summer of our lives. We go to Cutter's Wharf in the evenings because nobody we know goes there. It's an older crowd, suits and secretary, some students from Queen's. Usually we sit inside, but one evening when the clouds lift and the rain ceases, we take our drinks out onto the terrace. The river from benches and tables are damp and cold, but we put plastic bags down and sit on those. It isn't warm, but there's a feeling of sitting under the full sky, that pale, high light of a northern evening, and there is a salt freshness of the breeze coming up the lagging from the loch. After we leave Cutter's Wharf that night, we walk. We walk along the lagging and through the Holy Lands, Palestine Street, Jerusalem Street, Damascus Street, Cairo Street. We cross the river and walk the whole sweep of the Ormo embankment. The tide is turning and a two-person canoe is skimming down river, slate grey and quicksilver. When we reach the point where the road curves away from the river, the pale evening light still lingers, so we keep walking across the Ravenhill Road, down Toronto Street and London Street and the London Road, Rosebury Road and Willfield Drive and across the Woodstock Road and on, further and further east, until we're in Van Morrison Territory, Hindford Street and a better parade, Grand Parade, the North Road, Orange Field. There are times in your life or maybe just the one time when you find yourself in the right place, the only place you could possibly be and with the only person. She feels it too. She turns to me. These streets are ours, she says. Yes, I say, yes, they are. And they were, the whole city was. Um, so when I was writing that story, that's a story of um, two young women, teenagers in love. Um, I was thinking, I was thinking about pride marches. Um, I was thinking about reclaim the night. I was thinking about the ways in which walking is a particular way of asserting your right to be in a place and you know, and of, and of claiming a place. And I was thinking of the ways in which when I was growing up, I never walked in Belfast. <laughs> you know, you would get a bus to the city center and walk around it with your friends or you might drive to a beauty spot or to a forest and walk there. But I'd never, the first time I ever walked into the city center, um, I was 27. I brought my then boyfriend, now husband, um, back home to Belfast for the first time. And we were getting the bus into town. We walked, bus didn't come, walked onto the next stop, walked onto the next. And he said, why don't we just walk? And it had never occurred to me that you could do that. We walked far longer distances in London, um, everywhere. But there's something, Mark Hackett of the Forum for Alternative Belfast, which is an urban planning architecture summer school that ran for several years, he describes, um, I've got his quote here because it's horrible, it's lovely, um, he describes shatter zones of, of road networks blighting the city, he talks about a grey donut of neglect um, that's really frightening to traverse all the way around Belfast city centre. And um, so it's, it's hard, it's possible, but it's hard to walk the city um, for lots of reasons in, in Belfast. And so it felt to me really important, a way of reclaiming the city by walking it. And as you say, Louise, it's um, funny, all of the walks that I do of Belfast, um, especially over the last year, um, are online, you know, are through Google Maps. Or I will quite often send my mum and dad on errands, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll say, you know, Leave, leave, leave our house and turn right and walk to the end of the street and look up towards Cairnburn. And at this time of year, what can you see through the trees? Can you see the hills? Can you? And so it's, it, it feels really strange. And I think often of, um, there's an essay by John Hewitt, very famous essay called The Bitter Gourd. And he says, um, the writer must be a rooted man. Of course, the writer's a man in, in, in this world. The writer must be a rooted man who must carry the native tang of his idiom like the native dust on his sleeve. Otherwise, he's an airy internationalist, thistle down, a twig in the stream. And it's something that I felt so often, you know, living in London and writing Belfast. Um, do I have the right to? Am I far too far away from it to be able to? Um, but writing the stories in multitudes and some of the stories in intimacies, I realized that the Belfast, the 90s Belfast that I create and the distance that I write from it wouldn't be possible if I still lived there all of those things would be overlaid um, you know by new quotidian walks um, and so I like um, there was an essay by Nicholas Allen in the Irish Times that several of you might have read where he talks about a different um, way of being northern northern Irish and he he says there's another north diasporic fragmentary and dispersed 
And it's that really that I'm thinking about a lot in intimacies. And on that question of walking, um, over the last year or so, I've been working with a couple of shamanic practitioners for various reasons. I find it very interesting. And they will say that there's a sort of walk that you do that you set out with maybe an intention or you try to clear your mind before you set out and you don't talk to anyone. You just see the signs of the landscape and you try to feel yourself connected to all of it. And it always makes me think of Henry James, um, you know, uh, when he talks about how a writer um, has to be like a cobweb of sensibility, like taking everything and not missing anything. And so I always like to think of, um, partly my sense of direction is awful as well. I always get lost. So I'm quite often, you know, wandering through a city. And um, I love the idea of, of ley lines, like you, Louise, that sense of places overlaid and places that have been, places that have been before we came to them. So I'll finish off by reading this, a cup, just a couple of paragraphs um, of, uh, this is from Intimacies. This is a story called People Tell You Everything, said on Christmas Eve. I'd been into the city centre that morning, the last minute messages my mother needed, posh cheese and biscuits for the neighbours coming over, extra rolls of wrapping paper. It was nothing I couldn't have got on the local high street, but I loved the almost empty bus into town, then walking the Christmas Eve streets the knot of goths in front of the city hall, refusing to concede the festive season, the cigarette lighter men of my childhood, now that people hadn't the need of five lighters for a pound, selling flashing Santa hats and antlers and bristling strings of tinsel instead. The birch trees on Donegal Place, slender and bare, drawn up in the clear air, waiting. Into Corn Market, where the bandstand used to be, and the ravaged old man with his megaphone and placards, impossible to tell if the end he was proclaiming was nigh or now. The sky that Christmas Eve morning was pale, the hills iron grey with cold, the city ingathered. Seagulls in from the loch, wheeling in circles, landing on lampposts and folding and unfolding their disdainful wings, the sense that despite themselves, they were restlessly waiting too. There was a hidden river running the length of high streets, the ones you knew about you couldn't help but feel underfoot, the eastward tug of it, and I always ended my walk by following its path past the Albert clock and into Custom House Square, where its culverts met the lagging. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Um, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce Jan Carson. Um, Jan is such an indefatigable force in Irish letters. And she's she may be the only writer to have published not one, but two books into this pandemic. Um, last year's Postcard Stories 2 with Yemma Press, and this year's The Last Resort. And I think that's a sign of not bad luck, but just sheer work ethic. Um, Jan is one of the hardest working and most dedicated writers that I know, not just to her own works, but to community arts practice too, and the importance that literature should have in the lives of all. Um, I've used her postcard stories practice frequently, where you write one story a day and give or send it to someone. Um, it's really inspired, especially the teenagers that I've mentored. Um, it lights up their imagination so much. Um, Jan's work has gone from strength to strength in recent years. Her novel, The Firestarters, won the EU Prize for Literature. And her story, which should have won on title alone, In the Car with the Rain Coming Down, was shortlisted for last year's BBC National Short Story Award. Um, Jan grew up in a fundamentalist Presbyterian community and tradition that's particularly under, sometimes unrepresented in Irish literature, where art, literature, music was seen as suspect a distraction from what really mattered at best um, and idolatrous at worst, um, the worship of graven images. Um, Jan's written very movingly in Kevin Barry and Olivia Smith's Winter Papers about how it's many years since she stepped away from the religion of her childhood, but she still can't bring herself to dance. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, Jan, as a lover of folklore, fairy tales, theology, myself, time and again, there's a message in a story that what seems like a great curse can actually transpire can actually end up being your greatest blessing and I know that you've had to overcome so much mentally and spiritually in order to write um, in order to believe that it's a worthwhile pursuit and use of one's life but yet I think that grounding and the ferocious wild imagery of the Old Testament has forged a magical imagination entirely your own and entirely unique in Irish literature um, in your story Pillars for example which I edited for being various the magical column of flames appears one morning at the foot of the lead character's bed. And um, you said this comes straight from the flaming pillars that lead the children of Israel through the desert. 
Um, I love that your brain does that. <laughs> um, I would love to ask you um, to talk a little bit more about all of that. Yeah, thank you so much. Let's see, I, I love to talk about fundamentalist Presbyterianism as everybody knows. Um, I really, really appreciate the question and um, I've appreciated listening to everything that everyone said tonight and scribbled down notes of notes. Um, I guess when I was thinking about this, um, the, the first thing that came to mind about growing up the way I did was, I think I got given the gift of excessive boredom really early on. And I think as writers, we sometimes um, undermine the idea of being bored. I think good ideas come from boredom. Um, I used to go to church four or five times every Sunday and be bored to the back teeth and have to go into yourself to this reserve of kind of making things up in your head and creating these narratives. And I think that sometimes where really good stories begin at the end of yourself. Um, we can be very easily distracted by these kind of shimmery, shiny, like kind of fickle things on the surface. Well, I can anyway as a writer. I want to go and write about that. That's a clever you know, crazy, slightly off the wall idea. But when you are forced through boredom to go beyond it into something a little bit deeper, I think for me, I'm beginning to learn after 15 years of writing that that's where the really good stories come from spending a lot of time and going beyond yourself. And I guess the last year and a bit has felt like a very long extended church surface for me where I've had to go into that bored place often. Um, almost every day because I live by myself and I'm finding different things are coming out of my work because I'm sp having to spend time going beyond myself with it. So I guess that's the first thing. The second thing you kind of talked about a little bit already is the language and the cadence of religious rhetoric is what I grew up with. I grew up with the King James Bible and I still love the language that comes from that and the language of Presbyterianism has a real rhythm and flow to it. Um, I don't always love what it's saying, but I love the way it sounds. Um, and I've always thought about, and um, George Saunders has a quote, which I'm going to paraphrase really wildly, where he talks about in writing, there's a pendulum. And, you know, quite often we swing towards meaning in what we write. And then we swing back towards kind of the flow and sound of what we write. But there is a sweet spot right in the middle where you land upon writing that means and resounds like that, but also has a wonderful flow and lyricality to it and that's I think that's that came very much from growing up in that tradition of wanting to write words that have power but also sound really wonderful and um, sometimes you can actually hear with those old, old Presbyterian hymns without the music you can hear what they should sound like there's a there's such a strong sense of lyricality to it so that's the kind of second thing that um, I think growing up the way I did gave me as a, a weird blessing um, and it's made me think a lot about how how my voice sounds and I'm coming into that more and more I think I'm going into a phase in my writing where I want to write as a Bellamina person rather than a Belfast person and that's almost painful to say like I've been kind of um, enamored with this lovely rush of dairy writers beginning to come and going you know where is the Bellamina literary revival it's just me and a few sheep at the minute but I really want to pay attention to how, how language and even how thought sounds in the, the tongue that I grew up in. Um, the third thing that I, I think I, I got given was a kind of primary storytelling language. And I think every writer, short story or novelist has a kind of primary story language, whether you grew up with the stories that came from your mad uncle, or you grew up with the kind of Iliad, or you grew up with Irish mythology. I grew up with the Old Testament for better for or worse. So it's how I learned to tell stories and I will always probably default to that as my primary storytelling language. So things like kind of justice and grace and uh, the sins of the fathers and those kind of themes come up over and over again in my stories. And as you mentioned, also those kind of parabolic kind of allegories and things. And I also love the idea you get from that of stories having a multiplicity of meanings. Um, there's a verse in the Bible in Mark 4 where Jesus is asked, why do you talk in parables? And he says that they may be ever hearing, but never understanding. And I'm like, I feel like that's what every short story writer does. You know, we write stuff that people hear and don't understand, and that's the beauty of it. That's what a parable is. So I'm, I'm very much drawn to that. And I think the final thing that I got given is magic realism. Um, you know, pretty much every religious text is a magic realist text. 
I was thinking about this I was, as I was preparing for this. You know, their religious books are books that are set in the real world where fantastical things happen. The Bible definitely is full of like every, every miraculous occurrence is an example of magic realism because it takes place in the context of Palestine or, you know, it, it grounded it in the real world. And so I guess I'm drawn to that and I thought about it often. Why am I drawn to that? And I think it's because those fantastical elements are elevating concepts to me. They always talk about seeing the potential in a person or a situation that they're not just this flatline realism, they're actually capable of other things, the miraculous, the mystical, the fantastical. And I think that's particularly important in Northern Ireland um, and particularly important in the Protestant community that, that I write about because we're quite often characterized as really dour um, because we are, to be honest. We don't dance a lot, we don't, you know, it's not a lot of crack growing up in a fundamentalist Presbyterian community, but that doesn't mean that people don't have the potential for magical, beautiful, wondrous things happening. Um, and that's kind of what I want to do when I use the magic realism here. Um, I guess I'm, I'm working on a paper about magic realism in Northern Irish literature at the minute. And one of the things that comes up over and again is we just don't have a tradition of it in Northern Ireland. Our prose is realist linear with very little kind of strange stuff happening. Um, and the thing about magic realism is that it's usually comes from post-colonial places. Um, and as you see these post-colonial voices um, raising and speaking and talking about what their own experiences, they're, they're quite often using the fantastical and challenging like the, you know, the Western dominant narrative is realist. And these kind of voices that speak about fantastical things are challenging that. So I think it's going to be quite interesting as we look at what ha what's happening with the breakdown of the UK at the minute, different conversations about where Ireland is headed. I'm already seeing more fantastical elements coming out of the north, and I think it'll be interesting to kind of trace that and see if it changes. I've now talked too long. Um, I'm going to read very briefly a page and a half from The Last Resort, which is a collection of linked short stories set in a very dour um, caravan park on the north coast of Northern Ireland. Um, I'm gonna read Malcolm's story. Malcolm is, and I can't actually say this word, I think it's telekinesis. No, that's not right. Somebody who moves things with his mind, um, but he also has a bit of a drink problem, so he's not been able to move many things recently. It's not coming easy this morning. There's something about this place. Everything feels heavier here. Maybe it's because of that girl who died. A murder leaves something hanging in the air. It's a scientific fact. They had it on the X-Files once. I've been staring at this teaspoon for an hour and it hasn't budged an inch. It's not even wobbled. You need a clean head to lift and mind pure thumping from last night's session. I'll hardly be making much project progress today, but I can't give up. Every time I think about calling it a day, maybe cracking up no he can days ahead. I remember the billboard opposite the chipper. Forty friggin' feet of my brother's big lordy face taunting me every time I go in for a fish supper. Look, Lagardia, the next generation, Steve at Blaine. Folks stop me in the street to ask, is that not your Lewis in the purple satin get up? It's done well for himself with the magic. Why is he going by a different name? Why indeed? What the hell's wrong with playing old Lewis Leggy? He says it doesn't have the same ring to it. They made him change it for the TV show. He had to learn how to speak better too. Apparently English ones aren't great with provincial accents. It's mostly English folks who watch that show. Whatever they done, it worked. My brother's a big cheese now. He's got his own programme starting soon and a stadium tour. Next year, Comic Relief are getting him to, to lift Blackpool Tower. He claims he wanted to do Stormont, but his agent thought there might be political connotations. It's just big talk on Lewis's part, shifting Stormont, doing his PR photos at the Giant's Causeway, inviting Liam Neeson onto his show like the pair of them were old muggers. My brother's only from here when it suits him. The truth is, he sold out long ago. He's forgotten where he come from. Maybe he's ashamed of it. He's only acting the local celebrity now he's famous. The same boy couldn't get away from here quick enough. You shouldn't pretend to be something you're not. I don't care how fed up you are. 
When I get my break, I won't be flapping around in a sequent jumpsuit or speaking all laddie da. I won't be relocating to bloody Kent. Would I consider changing my name? I would not. I'm proud to be Cullibacky born and bred, proud to have cut my teeth lifting tractors on a farm. Damn it, I'm even proud to sound like I've a mouthful of boiled potatoes. I'd be prouder still when I've my own billboard. Malcolm Leckie, Ulster's premier telekinesisist. I'd have a wee note at the bottom explaining telekinetics is moving stuff with your mind in case folks thought it was something to do with fixing phones. I'll leave it there. Um, Folks, we have a couple of questions. I know we've gone a little tiny bit over, not too bad actually. Um, I have been totally lost, so I have no clue what time it is. It's 10 past eight. If you need to run on to watch Holby, for example, that is absolutely fine. I would also be doing that if I could. If not, if you don't mind, we'll stick around for a few minutes and answer these questions. And if you've got another question, please, please pop it in the Q&A and I will field them out here. Um, our first question is from Maeve. Have any of the authors ever written a novel or have they always naturally gravitated to the short story? So I'll maybe fill that out to Adrian and Duncan or is anyone else working on a novel or want to? You can give me give me the eye if you want to jump in, but I'll maybe start with Adrian and then we'll move on to, to Lucy. See, because I know both of them have worked on both. Um. Yeah, to, to, to answer your question, yeah, um, I started writing short stories first, um, um, and it wasn't until about 2014 or so that I, that I began writing the, the first novel, Love Notes from a German Building Site, and um, it took me about five years to, to write that, to, to find that book, essentially, um, to find the character properly, and then the second novel came far more easily and far more quickly, um, but all during that time, I was kind of, whenever I wasn't working on the novels, I was work on a short story or I'd pick up a short story that I hadn't completed or whatever. So I was kind of going over and back um, between between the two. Um, but I haven't written a short story in, in a couple, like in outside of completing this the, the collection, I haven't begun a short story since. Um, but I'm sure it'll come back at some stage. But um, yeah, that's kind of, that's my situation, I suppose. Yeah, I've written um, three novels, four in fact, because I've got a new one coming out next year. Um, novella, stories, plays, radio drama. Um, I've written across a lot of forums and I always find that the key to it is being in control of that form that you're working with. You know, what are its precise possibilities, limitations, challenges, what can that form and only that form do? It's interesting, it was lovely hearing um, John Patrick talk about dialogue and plays because the more that I've written across forums, the more I've come to see short stories as much more akin to plays than a prose form. I think that a short story isn't really a prose form. Um, a short story, like a play, Kevin Barry has a brilliant phrase where he talks about a high wire act. Um, and there's something about a short story in a play where they set their own time. You know, a novel, you can read a couple of chapters or you can read it all in one go. You know, you can, a short story, a play, you have to concentrate, you have to be with it for its duration. Um, and you can't lose concentration or something and it goes slack. Um, with my, I, I made the rookie mistake, I wrote my first novel and I had this idea for a collection of short stories. Um, they were all going to be about young women set in Belfast or between Belfast and London. Um, and I wrote the whole thing before my first novel was published and not a single one of the stories worked. They were even less than the sum of their parts. And it was a real, um, <laughs> you know, the short stories are really, really tricky for them. And I think it took, took me years of writing different forms to have something of the technique to make it work. Um, two of the stories in Multitudes are their first drafts go back 11 years um, and every year or so I would come back to the idea to see if I had enough of the technique to make it work and I never did and I never did until I started, started to and that came from writing across a lot of different forms I think. Short stories are really really magical, really tricksy. Thanks guys. I'm going to, we've got quite a few questions, so we're not all going to jump in on all of them. I'm going to sort of dole them out here. So um, it's a bit fairer. Um, Helen has asked, and I'm going to fire this over to John Patrick and Louise. Um, a few of you spoke about admiring or envying things that other writers do that feel quite far from your own skills. 
I'm curious to hear about any bits of craft that are guaranteed to spur your professional envy when you spot them in a story. So those things and stories that make you go, ah, oh, why can't I do that? Louise, I'll maybe start with you because you're unmuted. Um, am I? Oh God, I'm probably like coughing and making terrible noises. I thought I was muted. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think actually this again probably goes back to Lucy, which I'm going to start like fangirling again, like a maniac. Um, but I uh, was uh, ended up in um, River Mill by myself uh last winter before um before um we got locked down and um i got very excited because i could access all of this bbc stuff that i can't get down here so i listened to um the children uh, lucy's story that was shortlisted for um for the for the short story award last year and i think there was just something about um maybe um like um it, it just you know the way when you hear things read aloud you, you know if there are any issues at all with syntax or whatever it'll be picked up uh, immediately but it just sounded so seamlessly perfectly beautiful just such beautiful elegant sentences um so yeah i'm um i'm kind of um i get terribly jealous of sentences other people's sentences hey um I suppose, yeah, I get the same kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I love a good sentence. So if someone has a good sentence, I'm kind of like, ah. But I suppose the one thing I never, I think envious has like a bad nature to it when I get kind of competitive maybe, but like in a good way, you know, I see someone doing really well. I'm like, oh, I want to do, I want to get that good. Um, so like any of my envy, it's, I, I like to think it's quite constructive. Like for example, I'm, I'm overwrite like a madman. So I'm always really jealous of, as, of a writer that can like quickly jump their narration forward. So that's the one thing, if you ever pick up a book I own, you'll see me marking each narrative jump. Um, so I'm envious of that, but I like to think I'm envious in a way that I'm trying to learn that it's like, you know, cause you're always trying to get better as a writer. Um, and like hearing Lucy saying that about her short stories not working, that kind of blew my mind. So I was like, Lucy Caldwell's short story's not working. There's, you know, there, <laughs> in some way, there's like a nice thing to learn from that, you know? So envious of anything good, but not in a, a, a mean way, I'd like to think. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll jump in and answer this one as well. Like, I am super envious of Adrian. I think if you look at our little squares on um, Zoom tonight, it's a pretty good synopsis of where we differ as writers. Um, Adrian's minimalism and the kind of pristine quality to his sentences and, and how he does that, I, I just can't. And, you know, you can see from my bookcase behind me, um, I'd love to be a minimalist, but I just cannot ever bring myself to keep things neat and clean. Um, so I'm always in awe of those writers who um, can get in and get out and say things in a kind of simple, uncluttered way. Um, I'm probably like, as John Patrick is saying, you know, always put everything in there's too much and then you spend hours and hours and hours in the edits um, we have a question here specifically for specifically for louise from sarah um, sarah sarah says louise if you were to read one of your short stories aloud for a group of leaving search students which one would you choose and why um i'd probably read belladonna i think um because it's about um a, a, a school girl who's having a miserable time um, and who gets to have some revenge. So that's probably what I'd read. Um, um, yeah, my school days were completely miserable and I'm presuming that if they were leaving search there, there'd be quite a few, there'd be quite a few students who are having a bad time as well. Um, yeah, so that's probably why I'd do that. And also because there's loads of sex in some of the other stories as well, so it might be that appropriate. <laughs> um, we're going to move on to the next question. I'm going to do a quick um, survey here and um, can I ask of our five writers, have any of you never lived outside of Ireland? So we've all ventured beyond the shores at some point. So maybe everyone can tip in on this. Um, Stephen Walsh asks, Irish writers should have a mandatory quarantine. I'm not sure I like the use of the word quarantine there, but a mandatory quarantine outside of Ireland so that they can write about Ireland, discuss. So it's the old chestnut of, do you have to leave Ireland to be able to write well about Ireland? Um, we we'll maybe stuck as our furthest flung author tonight. Adrian, do you want to kick off with this one? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I think definitely one thing is, is that has benefited me is li living in a country where I don't, where I didn't, I don't speak the word language naturally. Um, so living in Germany and having to learn how to speak German has had a huge effect on 
my writing. Um, I would say also like living away from Ireland, you definitely do have a different perspective on the country because you're always looking at it from afar, from newspaper reports and that kind of stuff. It's very different reading a newspaper report away from the country than reading the same report in the country. Um, so I think it does give you a certain perspective. And from my point of view, I kind of, I look back at sort of um, uh, historical developments um, as well from here. And I don't know, I think I can kind of, but I've been able to see it on the land, these develop, historical developments that I'm interested in, technical developments largely, um, that I can kind of read about them and imagine them a little bit more clearly by, without having to go to the places where they are. So like a power station, a substation, that kind of stuff. Um, so in, to a certain extent, yeah, it, do, it has added sort of things to my life in terms of language and, and that kind of stuff. But then at the same time, if I was living in Ireland, you know, I'm sure there'd be loads of things that would have uh, added to, to, to how I might have written as well. So it's just the way that it has turned out. You know, I don't think there's any, you know, I, wouldn't, I don't think there's any kind of, uh, you know, there's no value judgment in, any, in either, I don't, I don't think. Um, Lucy? Do you know what? I, I think I slightly answered that in um, the reading that I gave in the Thinking About Place. So very quickly instead, I'll chip in on the previous question about envy, um, because that sounded as if it might have come from a writer. And there was one thing that I wanted to say that I wish I'd known when I was starting, that we tend to dismiss the things that come to us naturally. Um, you know, I always think I can do rhythm of syntax. I grew up playing the violin from a very young age and I can hear things perfectly. And that's, that's what I can do. Um, I can ventriloquize characters. Um, there are so many other things that I just can't do. And the first things that I wrote, um, my first novel was a six-year-old girl, present tense, I'm 16 year old girl. And so I tied myself under such knots with everything that came after that because I had the idea that to be a real writer you had to write third person and past tense and you know I can never I'm not very good at metaphor simile I never really know what characters look like from the outside because I always experience them from the inside and I think your question there are if you if you are a writer whoever asked that question there will be things that you can do and only you can do you know the way that you are in the world and see the world and the sum total of your experiences that even yeah, don't dismiss those um, out of envy for all of the other sort of magic tricks that other writers seem to have. Um, so maybe that's maybe I hope that's 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 helpful or encouraging to hear. Yeah. Even though I went off piece, sorry, Jen. No, no, everyone is completely entitled to go off piece all over the place. Um, Louise. But this is about um about whether you, it's it's best to, you know it's better to to go away. Yeah, like you've I lived in different places. Yeah, there. I don't know. Like I I've lived in uh, loads of different places, but um well, I don't know. I mean, if you look at the if you look at um like Eugene McCabe, who was a farmer, who you know farmers don't get to go away from home very often, and who uh, was just a completely uh, wonderful writer. So I think sometimes maybe what Lucy says is right it's about what you're carrying yourself and about your view of the world and it doesn't necessarily ha you know you don't necessarily have to to, to to write from a distance or to go to other places um you know that he was like completely steeped in in in, in the place where he lived and um, just wrote wonderful fiction so yeah I, I think it, it kind of um resonates with what Lucy just said like it's what you find out what works for you like mm -hmm. I once got told in no uncertain terms on stage by a writer that you can't possibly write about Northern Ireland until you've lived away from it. Um, I, it was a man. Um, and I don't think that's true. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, there's plenty of people who contradict that and have mm -hmm. beautiful, wonderful writing careers. But there are also people who need to do that. Like, I know personally, if I hadn't gone to the States for four years, I would never have crawled out from under Presbyterianism, mm -hmm. made any art at all. So. I think it's just what works for you. What What do you think, John Patrick? Yeah, I'd be in similar mind of Louise. Like I only went away for a year and a bit um, to do a master's, but like I don't think if I was, you know, I don't think that radically changed my view of Ireland. I suppose the one thing, and I'd probably chime with everyone here, time is the thing that makes a difference to me. Um, like I I write about Ackle, an Ackle I know. Well, sorry, I might have given away. I write about an island. Uh, <laughs> but it's an island I know from my childhood summers and stuff like that and it's a childhood it's an island warped by my memories and of and the nostalgia and how I viewed it uh, and because I can because I have a bit of distance I'm able to get depth uh, 
that I wouldn't be able to get about maybe something that happened a year ago, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think that distance is, is in my opinion, I don't think it, it, it's needed or would make much of a difference to me as a rider. But I'm, again, there's probably loads of riders where it does make a difference, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've got three questions left um, and I'm going to try and fly through these and finish by half past to be fair to everybody. So I'm going to split the first two and give them to two people. And then the last one you can all be thinking about is the, the question I knew I would get in this session. If you can only recommend one short story collection, which short story collection would you recommend? So you can be mulling away at the back. That'll be our final question. Um, I'm going to ask um, John Patrick and Adrian, what can the short story do for the reader that other forms can't? And that's a question from Rose. What, what can the short story do for the reader that other forms can't? And um, maybe start with Adrian. Um, I was chatting about this with Cathy uh, Sweeney about a week or two ago. Cathy um, uh, put out a collection of stories called uh, Modern Times, A Sting of Fly, uh, Widenfell and Nicholson last year. I was just talking about the scale, the actual, you know, the actual number of words in short stories is 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 um is far less, obviously, than say a novel or a novel. And I was, I'm interested in the, in the idea that novel, a novel is like writing with a machine in the middle of it. There's a certain kind of amount of horsepower in it, and that there's a certain kind of forgetting that's essential in in, in a novel just simply because of the distance between things. And I think in a short story, it's easier to remember. Um, easier to remember things and to recall things. So that has a different effect on resonances through the story and handling it is totally different for the writer. But I think for the reader, um, it's like a sort of, um, to me, there's just a smaller, the, the distance is tighter in terms of what can happen and what can be remembered. Um, and that to me is, um, that to me is for the reader, the, uh, a very, very interesting aspect of the short story. Um, and it's a part that I'm very, very interested in then when I write, I keep that kind of speciality in mind. Um, so yeah, that'd be my. Sorry. Uh, yeah, for what the short story thing is special. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, you're reading Alice Munro's story and you're like, well, that can do everything a novel does as well, you know? So there are examples, but I think the one thing I always go back to about a short story is the intensity of the language. Um, I always suppose, as at least you said, it's, it's kind of close to poetry in that way. It's still a story, but I always feel like the language is a driving force for every story I love. And that doesn't mean you need ornate language or elaborate language. It just means there has to be an intensity in a sentence. And I feel like a short story is a sentence by sentence form like no other. And I feel like if, if one story doesn't, if one sentence doesn't work in a story, and the whole story start, starts to crumble. I don't think there's many forms like that. And that's why it makes me so excited by a short story is that language and that intensity. So I think when I read a short story, what really kind of excites me is that language and how the writer is using it and using it at like a, a very high temperature, you know, in a way that a novel, if you had a novel at that high temperature throughout, putting it down is too much. Whereas a, a short story, you will stick with it and it will move you in a way that I don't think many things can. Um, we've got a lovely question from the equally lovely Kat Hogan, um, who asks, um, and I'm going to ask this to Louise and Lucy, and I'll jump in at the end. Um, is there one specific character that you've met in your, in your own short stories that's your, your favourite, the one that you'd save first, which is a little bit like which of your children do you like the best, which is probably an unfair question. Um, <coughs> but um, Lucy, do you have a, a favourite character from your own short stories? But you know what, I get to cheat because in both those story collections, there's 11 stories. They're all narrated by young women, um, none of whom have names. And I had the idea that with all of them, though biographical details, like facile details, like someone has a brother and someone has two sisters and someone's an only child, although those sort of things change, the short story collections are very much an entirety. They are, they, they're almost like a cubist portrait of young womanhood and intimacies follows on so directly that, um, that, that yeah, um, that I would, do you know, the story that I read from um, Here We Are is a story very close to my heart. And so I would like to rescue that young couple, I think, both together, give them a chance. <laughs> Lucy, yeah. that's such a diplomatic answer. It's like, I've only got one brother. So my mum always says, I'm <laughs> your daughter. Um, your kind of diplomacy there. Louise, who are you rescuing? 
Uh, I'm rescuing Stacey Ramey, who makes an appearance uh, in two stories. And the first time she appears, aged about 18, wearing leopard print Wellingtons and um, in a lambing shed that's also a grow house. And she she's there to tempt um, the, uh, the husband of a, a heavily pregnant um, uh, woman. And, um, and then um, she, I mean, I guess her, her role in that is pretty inglorious, but she gets to redeem herself in, in another story later on um, called Hands. Um, when she's a bit older. Um, so yeah, I totally save her. No, it's, it's really weird because you've both kind of said the same sort of thing. I'm going to say, um, like, I have one character that I keep reinventing in lots of different short stories and you kind of change their name and you give them slightly different attributes, but at the core, they're the same person. And um, I don't think anyone ever picks up that they keep appearing again and again. But that, that's the person that I would hold on to. Mm. Um, I'm not going to say who he is or <laughs> all suddenly go, you're writing the same short story over and over and over again. Um, we're coming to a close, folks. Um, and I'm going to leave everybody with um, that really nice question from Claire um, about short story collection recommendations. Um, this is a horrible, horrible question, Claire, in terms of reducing like all of the short story collections we've all read over the years down to one but um pens at the ready you might get something that you haven't encountered before um i'm going to just start at the top of my list louise which i'm sorry you're the first face at the top of my screen and we'll go down and um, one short story collection that you would recommend that is a really hard question um so i can only say my favorite short story collection today or this week the one that i'd recommend would be uh, the stories of eva luna by isabel allende mm. Excellent. Can you give us why? Why is it so good? Um, I think um, I think there is a great combination of. I mean, uh, it, it's not always as far as magic realism, but I think there's a lot of uh, like a kind of almost whimsy, and um, you know, the stories are quite elaborate, and the language is very elaborate. But yeah, she's dealing with things like um, sex workers and um, despots and um, and gorillas and. Um, and the and, and sort of raving beauties. Um, and there's you know some of it is very dark. You know, um, the she she goes there with with torture and, and war, but it's just like really exquisitely beautiful. Excellent, good. Uh, John Patrick, you're next on my hit list. I hate these questions because I always forget every single book I ever read <laughs> uh, or ever read. So uh, two just come to mind: Alice Munro. I don't think you can go wrong with any collection, but Dear Life by Alice Munro, amazing writer, like. The breath of a novel in a short story. She's hilarious as well. I think she's underappreciated for how funny she is. And a more modern one, which I, I think you're a big fan of, Jan, um, uh, Donald Antrim, um, uh, Ember Light in the Air. I just think he's an insanely good writer, line by line. Amazing. But not from Antrim. That's why I picked her up at the start. Um, despite the name, no connection to Antrim at all. Uh, Lucy, you're you're below John Patrick. Um, uh, Lucia Berlin, a manual for oh, cleaning yes. women. Um, her stories. She was wide, widely published in her life, but her stories were collected um, and only published um, after her death by Picador a couple of years ago. And um, there, she is one of those writers that you read at the exact precise right time in your life. And she was like a portal for me. She showed me so many other ways of doing things. She writes so close to the bone um, of her own life, which was very chaotic. And she, her stories, there's, they're, they're brilliant. She's a supreme stylist. Her stories, they can just spin on a sixpence, you know, and in terms of sentences, she turns and addresses a reader midway through a story. She does, her stories are so full of life. They're, they're, they're incredible. Um, so yeah, Lucia Berlin, a manual for cleaning women. Uh, two thumbs up for me on that one. Um, Adrian. Yeah, uh, this one is a, it is a very, very difficult question. I was just, I've just was drawn blanks. Um, well, I always, I always mention this one because I just still love it so much. Uh, it was Wendy Erskine's Sweet Home and that came out, it was two years ago. Oh, it just blew me out of the water. I was like, apart from the absolutely wonderful writing, the, the dialogue writing in it was just, it was doing, it was some sort of magic she was doing. I don't know, it was unbelievable. Anyway, so that's one. And the, um, Bruno Schultz, The Street of Crocodiles that, that, and other stories, that's, um, that was a bit of a mind blower when I came across that the first time as well. Um, so they'd be my two that I, that I definitely love. It's impossible to say one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Um, I'm going to throw into the mix um, Caris Davies, The Redemption of Galen Pike. 
um, just because it's a collection that I think should have got an awful lot more attention than it did. And I love it because it, um, it's nothing magic happens in it really, but it, it, all the stories are right at the end of the possible kind of thing in that really interesting quirky space. And it's also so thin, like if you're looking for a short read, it's tiny. So her concision is just miraculous. Um, and I'd really recommend it. Um, folks, we are at the end of our time. I see that we've managed to hold on to most of the participants. So hopefully that means that they're not <coughs> incredibly bored by what they've been listening to. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. Um, and can I um, just really, really um, encourage you to get along or phone up or get on the website of your independent bookstore wherever you are and buy all of these collections I've read them all they're all fantastic and um, our official bookshop for West Cork is the Bantry bookshop but um, please support which, whatever is closest to you because I know they really appreciate your custom at the minute and um, I'd like to thank all four writers who've been with us tonight for those who dressed in the um obligatory yellow Easter colours and those who didn't bother their backside to do it. Um, you're equally gratefully grateful for your, your time. Um, and a big, big thanks to, to West Cork. And I know um, Amor's going to pop back on again and just um, pronounce the benediction. If I remember to unmute myself. Uh, yes, just to thank uh, everybody who tuned in tonight to, to watch and most importantly to, um, to thank our writers uh, Jan has just thanked the other four writers, but obviously didn't thank herself. Um, the format of tonight was actually Jan's idea, and it, I think everybody agrees it was absolutely brilliant. So um, I'd just like to thank Jan Carson, Louise Kennedy, John Patrick McHugh, Lucy Caldwell, and Adrian Duncan for being our brilliant speakers tonight. Um, I would strongly encourage you all to go out and read their collections. And just to keep an, an, eye, an eye out on other events that they're doing and other events that we're doing in the festival as well. It's been brilliant having you all here. So thank you all so much for tuning in and big round of applause uh, to all of our speakers.